Baseball is a president tossing out the first ball of the season and a pudgy schoolboy playing catch with his dad on a Mississippi farm. A tall, thin old man waving a scorecard from the corner of his dugout. That's baseball. So is a big, fat guy with a bulbous nose running home one of his 714 home runs. There's a man in Mobile who remembers that Hannes Wagner hit a triple in Pittsburgh 46 years ago. That's baseball. And so is a scout reporting that a 16-year-old Sandlot pitcher in Cheyenne is the coming Walter Johnson. Baseball is a spirited race of man against man, reflex against reflex, of game of inches. Every skill is measured, every heroic, every failing, seen and cheered or booed, and then becomes a statistic. In baseball, democracy shines its clearest. The only race that matters is the race of the bag. The creed is a rule book, and color, merely something to distinguish one team's uniform from another. Baseball is a rookie, his experience no bigger than the lump in his throat as he begins fulfillment of his dream. It's a veteran, too. A tired old man of... 35, hoping those aching muscles can pull him through another sweltering August and September. Nicknames of baseball, names like Zeke and Pie and Kai Kai and Home Run and Cracker and Dizzy and Dazzy. Baseball is the clear, cool eyes of Rogers Hornsby, the flashing spikes of a Ty Cobb and an overaged pixie named Rabbit Moranville. Baseball, just a game, as simple as a ball and bat, and yet as complex as the American spirit it symbolizes. It's a sport, a business, sometimes almost even religion. Why, the fairy tale of Willie Mays making a brilliant World Series catch and then dashing off to play stickball in the streets with his teenage pals. That's baseball. And so is the husky voice of a doomed Lou Gehrig saying, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. Baseball is cigar smoke, hot roasted peanuts, ladies day, down in front, take me out the ball game, the seventh inning stretch, and the star spangled banner. Baseball is a man named Campanella, telling the nation's business leaders, you have to be a man to be a big leaguer, but you have to have a lot of little boy in you too. This is a game for America, this baseball, a game for boys and for men. The sentiments of Hall of Fame broadcaster Ernie Harwell go a long way toward explaining what baseball is all about. But there is so much more. The players, the records, the winners and losers. The glorious history of baseball. That ball is going to be out of here. It's gone. It's 7-15. There's a new home run champion of all time. And it's Henry Aaron. This is the history of baseball. The roots of baseball can be traced to colonial England, where they played a game called rounders, and where the only way you could make an out was by hitting someone with a cloth-filled leather ball. As the game moved into the American colonies, it became known as town ball since it was often played on town meeting day. In time, the ball became harder, and the design of the game became more defined. Kids throughout the colonies soon found time to play the game every day. One young man from Cooperstown, New York, was erroneously credited with inventing baseball, Abner Doubleday. In fact, it was a land surveyor who created the game. In 1845, Alexander Cartwright compiled a set of rules for the New York Knickerbockers, bases 90 feet apart, nine men on a side, and three outs to an inning. In 1869, the Cincinnati Red Stockings became baseball's first professional team, 
and seven years later the National League was formed. The league's first game was between Boston and Philadelphia, and with that game came the initial recording of statistics and records that would fill endless pages with the game's rich history. The Chicago Cubs won baseball's first pennant, led by pitcher Albert Goodwill Spaulding. By 1880, the sport had spread to all 38 states, and the game's colorful professionals began to develop an avid following. Paying customers cheered the early greats, men like Cap Anson, the leading hitter of his time, Mike King Kelly, famed for his daring slides, and Ed Delahanty, his career cut short by a fatal spill off Niagara Falls. At the turn of the century, baseball had become the nation's game, and each city had its own ballpark. In 1901, Ban Johnson established a new league, the American League. Johnson struggled to put the league together, often raiding players from National League clubs, thus starting long-standing feuds, including one with the National League champion Baltimore Orioles and a fiery young third baseman named John McGraw. Later, as manager of the New York Giants, McGraw refused to compete in the 1904 World Series against Johnson's American League winners. But McGraw held out for only one year. In 1905, the Philadelphia Athletics, led by Connie Mack, won the American League pennant, and public opinion forced McGraw and his National League champions to relent. Two years earlier, Boston had beaten Pittsburgh five out of eight in the first World Series. In 1905, the format changed to four out of seven, and fans flocked to the polo grounds. And although no World Series was played in 1904, the stubborn McGraw delighted his following by raising a flag inscribed, New York Giants 1904 World Champions. The Athletics of 1905 were a solid team under Connie Mack, but they lost the World Series to McGraw's Giants in five games thanks to the greatest pitcher of the day, New York's Christy Mathewson, a 25-year-old college graduate with pinpoint control. During the season, Mathewson led the major leagues with 31 wins and a 1.27 earned run average, and then topped that off in the World Series by pitching three shutouts. The 1905 World Series was a triumph for the Giants and Mathewson, and after the final game, the team celebrated by taking a victory lap around the polo grounds in that remarkable new invention, the horseless carriage. In the early decades of the 20th century, Americans found more leisure time, so they rushed to the ballpark to see stars like Cy Young, who in his 22-year career won a staggering 511 games. Another outstanding pitcher was Walter Johnson of the Washington Senators. From 1910 to 1919, Johnson won 20 or more games for a team never strong at bat. He became known as the Big Train for a fastball that would help him record 3,508 strikeouts. He pitched more shutouts, 113, than any pitcher in baseball history, and was second only to Cy Young in games won. Johnson was as modest and gentle-tempered a man as ever played, and throughout his 28-year career as pitcher and manager, Johnson was always well-liked and respected. Equally admired was the Flying Dutchman of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Hannes Wagner. At shortstop, Wagner had no peer, and at bat, he used the great strength of his forearms to win eight batting titles in 12 seasons. Wagner also led the league in stolen bases five times. Just 5 foot 11, Hannes weighed more than 200 pounds, and though not graceful, he was the most complete ball player of his time. This famous split grip belonged to baseball's all-time batting leader, Ty Cobb. The accomplishments of the Georgia Peach are as impressive today as they were more than 50 years ago. In the course of his 24 years, Cobb set major league records for games played, base hits, 
runs scored, and stolen bases. And his lifetime batting average of 367 is the highest in the game's history and more than 100 points above the entire league's average during the same period. Cobb's genial appearance belied a fiercely combative nature. He had few friends in the game, but no one denied his greatness. Staunch competition came from the Boston Red Sox Tris Speaker, who played the shallowest but most complete center field of the day and compiled a 344 lifetime average. Another leading player of the era was Rabbit Moranville, the Boston Braves' brilliant shortstop. In 1914, on the eve of World War I, Moranville led the Braves from last place in mid-July to a World Series sweep over the Athletics in October. Thus, the Miracle Braves of 1914. In 1919, Joe Jackson and the Chicago White Sox won the American League pennant. Jackson hit 351, another great season for the man with the third highest lifetime average in baseball. That same year, the White Sox Ed Sicotti was the major's leading hurler with 29 wins. The Sox were in the World Series against the Cincinnati Reds, and the experts favored Chicago. But Cincinnati surprised the country by winning. The following year, America was even more surprised by an investigation led by baseball commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Jackson, Sicotti, and six others had conspired to throw the series. The Black Sox scandal of 1919 threatened to destroy the game. But Judge Landis took strong action. The accused were banned from baseball for life, and the game's integrity was restored. It is my belief that baseball is loved by an entire nation because it embodies that priceless spirit of equality that is the very backbone of America itself. Baseball needed a new image, a hero, and a young left-handed pitcher for the Boston Red Sox was just the man, George Herman Ruth. His schooling came from the streets, cheap saloons, and a Baltimore orphanage. But the babe had a bubbling, outgoing personality that would soon claim the overwhelming affection of the American public. In 1916, at the age of 21, Babe Ruth won 23 games, becoming the best left-hander in the league. But his mound success was merely a prelude to his skill at bat. The Red Sox converted Ruth into an outfielder, and baseball was in for a revolution. In 1920, the New York Yankees purchased Ruth's contract from Boston. They wanted him to hit home runs in the Polo Grounds, the park they shared with the Giants. Babe hit 54 and then 59 the next year. Then in 1923, Yankee Stadium opened and the legend of the Babe took off. Babe Ruth is in a class by himself. He even overshadows Fox and, and Gehrig and all the rest of them. Babe is in a separate category. Ruth is the only player I know that when he came out on the field, everybody stopped. It was like the star came onto the center stage, you know? And when he went up to take batting practice, nobody looked at anything else but Babe swinging that bat up. And I'm talking about his own players and I'm talking about the visiting team. And when you get that kind of magnetism, uh, you know that you're the star. But Babe had something else aside from the hitting and feeling and the pitching and all that. Uh, he had the look, you know, it was so distinctive. He uh, had that big smile, and even uh, in his waning years, why, uh, he was something. He electrified a ballpark, and that's just about all you could say about him. Ruth was raised in an orphanage, which might explain why he always found time for kids. Hello, Babe. How do you feel? Fine, Sonny. How's yourself? All right. Well, I'm glad the Yankees won. Well, so am I. I guess I'll see you in a World Series game, then. Well, I hope so. I guess I'm one of the lucky fellas to be able to get into ten World Series. And the way I feel now, looks like I'll be in there. Well, hope you hit a lot of home runs. Well, I won't predict anything, but I'll sure do my best. I hope all you boys will be out there watching. Ruth also became legendary for his carousing and carefree lifestyle. But those who played with him knew that behind the legend was quite an athlete. 
You read so much about how he did this and how he did that, but for seven years he was a great pitcher. We all know what type of hitter he was. Uh, for 22 years in the big leagues, he left a lifetime batting average, I believe, of 342. You can't carouse around, and anybody told me a man can carouse around as much as they say different people in sports do and still have a career like that. Ruth led New York to six pennants in eight years and founded a Yankee empire. With the addition of Lou Gehrig, a slugging first baseman from Columbia University, the already potent Yankee lineup was transformed into Murderer's Row. In 1927, Gehrig and Ruth put New York in a frenzy with an incredible home run race. Gehrig hit 46 through August, Ruth 43. But Lou hit just one more in September, while Babe had 17, giving him the record of 60. 1927 was a great year for the Yankees, Ruth, and Gehrig. The team won 110 games and the World Series. Ruth had 60 homers and Gehrig 175 RBIs. Gehrig went on to play in 2,130 consecutive games and Babe Ruth roared through the 20s with a style uniquely his own. But there were also plenty of other hitting heroes revered by the fans. Rogers Hornsby, the game's greatest right-handed hitter. In 1924, he batted 424 with the St. Louis Cardinals, the highest average ever. And in one five-year stretch, the Raja averaged 402. Bill Terry of the Giants the last National Leaguer to bat 400. George Sisler of the St. Louis Browns, who holds the record for 257 hits in a season. And Harry the Horse Heilman, another 400 hitter. Despite the number of pure hitters, sluggers thrived even more. Jimmy Fox, who challenged Ruth's mark of 60 homers with 58 in 1932. In 1930, the Cubs' Hack Wilson hit 56 home runs, a National League record. That same season, he drove in 190, a mark no other Major League player has reached. Mel Ott of the Giants was a small man who used his distinctive batting style to generate power and excite the fans. Mel Ott led the National League in home runs six times. While the hitters were enjoying baseball's upper hand, there was one pitcher who always held his own, Grover Cleveland Alexander. In 20 years of pitching, Alexander amassed 373 wins, the third highest total ever, and his record 16 shutouts in 1916 still stands. The Golden Age had arrived, and with it, the first All-Star game in 1933. We have a sellout, a big crowd, a fine day, and I hope the best team wins. Thank you. The words of John McGraw, who came out of retirement to manage against Connie Mack's American League stars, like Jimmy Fox, heavy hitting Al Simmons, catcher Mickey Cochran, and pitcher Lefty Grove. It was a grand occasion, and the idea was completely new. Nothing but stars, all stars, on the ball field. And when the game began, guess who stole the show with a two-run homer that provided the winning margin? In the book of baseball legend, everything was as it was supposed to be. Babe Ruth had made the American League victorious and the very first gathering of baseball's greatest stars. In 1934, at the second gathering, the show was stolen by Carl Hubble of the Giants, famed for his great screwball, which he mastered with deadly accuracy. King Carl struck out five straight future Hall of Famers, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, Al Simmons, and Joe Cronin. But after all, pitchers were making the news. A sensational brother act, Dizzy and Paul Dean, pitched the Cardinals to the pennant that year. Dizzy, comical, boastful, and completely original, won 30. Rookie Paul won 19. 
The city of St. Louis had World Series fever, kept hot by a rough and ready team called the Gas House Gang. Here's how the 1934 World Series was remembered by Cardinal Captain Leo DeRocher. Ball players don't come scrappier than Pepper Martin and Ducky Medwick, more talented than Dizzy Dean, tougher than manager Frankie Frisch. In the 1934 World Series, we took on Detroit, gas house style, no holes barred. They used to say that we'd knock over our grandmothers to get an extra base. In the fifth game, Dizzy Dean went into second base standing up to make sure Martin wasn't doubled at first. The first thing Dizzy said when he came to was, did they get Pepper? What the Gas House gang lacked in talent, they made up in guts. In the last game, we were winning nine to nothing, but still, Medrick started the fight sliding into third. When Medrick got back to the outfield, the Detroit fans were ready for him. They threw everything they could lay their hands on. I don't even know where they got half the stuff. Kennesaw Mountain Landis was commissioner of baseball, and the old judge called Frisch and Medrick over. He asked Ducky if he had kicked the Tiger third baseman. Medrick said, yeah, but that's the way I always slide. Judge Landis ordered Medrick out of the game, but not for fighting. He was the only man ever thrown out of a World Series for his own protection. In 1935, Cincinnati stepped into baseball's future by installing lights at Crosley Field. And for the first time, fans could see a ball game after a hard day's work. Ironically, it was the Reds who in 1938 met the Brooklyn Dodgers in the first night game at Ebbets Field. And Johnny Vandermeer, Cincinnati's 23-year-old left-hander, made baseball history by pitching his second consecutive no-hitter. Also in 38, Tiger slugger Hank Greenberg challenged Babe Ruth's 60 home runs. Greenberg had 58 with five games to go, but hit no more. That same year, the Chicago Cubs won the pennant on Gabby Hartnett's famous home run as darkness fell on Wrigley Field. The Cubs' World Series hopes rested on the sore arm of Dizzy Dean, acquired from the Cardinals. The Cubs' opponents were the Yankees, and in the second game of the series, Old Diz struggled bravely to hold the New Yorkers back. But Frank Crosetti hit an eighth-inning homer, and New York swept the series in four games. The Yankees were stronger than ever in the 30s, but two of their greats were passing from the game. In 1935, Babe Ruth joined the Boston Braves and with them hit his 714th and final home run. And in 1939, the Iron Horse, Lou Gehrig, was stricken with a form of polio. Honored at a packed Yankee stadium, this sad event included a few words from manager Joe McCarthy. When you came to my room in Detroit some time ago and told me that you thought that you were hindering the chances of the ball club by staying in the ball game. That was a day that I never wanted to see. For the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad break. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. When you look around, wouldn't you consider it a privilege to associate yourself with such a fine looking man as a standing in uniform in this ballpark today? 1939 saw the passing of one generation and the arrival of another. That year, a 21-year-old Iowa farm boy by the name of Bob Feller led the American League in wins and the majors in strikeouts. Two other youngsters also had great seasons, Ted Williams of the Red Sox and Joe DiMaggio of the Yankees. 
DiMaggio took the Yankees to the 39 World Series against Cincinnati. The Yankees had taken the first three games, and in the tenth inning of the fourth, with two men on, Joe DiMaggio singled to right. Charlie Keller stunned Reds catcher Ernie Lombardi, and with the ball just a few feet away, DiMaggio scored with a brilliant slide. The Yankees had swept another series, thanks in part to Lombardi's snooze. In 1941, Joe DiMaggio accomplished the near impossible. He set a record that many feel will never be broken, a record that began innocently enough against Chicago, and a pitcher long since forgotten. There's a fellow by the name of Edgar Smith of the White Sox. I got a base hit, didn't mean very much, but that started me off in my streak. DiMaggio kept banging out the hits, and a nation turned its adoring eye to his efforts. Eventually, he reached 45 games in a row, breaking the Major League record held by Wee Willie Keeler. But Jolt and Joe didn't stop there. It certainly was uh, something that I was quite proud of, and I was very happy to continue on, because not only did my streak continue, but we went on to uh, go on a uh, winning streak. DiMaggio's hitting streak finally ended in Cleveland. He'd gotten a hit in 56 consecutive games. But for the Yankee Clipper, this was old hat. You know, it wasn't as though I had not hit in some consecutive games before that, because it was 1933 in Pacific Coast League that I hit in 61. So I had some experience in feeling the pressure, so I, I thought I was doing pretty good as it was, no matter how uh, far that streak went. Although the Yankees did go on to win the World Series that year, it's DiMaggio's 56-game odyssey that will always be remembered. But there was another pretty fair country hitter who had a good year in 1941 and who set another hitting landmark. Talking about Ted Williams, who in 1941 led the major leagues with a 406 batting average. No one has hit higher than 400 since. Ted also had a memorable moment in the All-Star game. I've always said that home run I hit in the 41 All-Star game, uh, it was, was the, the biggest thing I had done, and a big moment. Uh, and I really believe in those days, the All-Star games, there's a little more importance on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, than, than I felt later on. But anyway, I hit this home run, and it was just like a guy shooting his first 10-point buck or <laughs> making your first million bucks. Oh, boy, that was the greatest <laughs> thing that ever happened to me. I, I, I don't think anything ever hit me quite like that did because it happened at the right time at a young career, and boom, there it was. William Swings has a high drive going deep, deep. It is a home A game-winning home run in the All-Star Game. A baseball dream come true. Yes, hitting that home run in the All-Star Game in the ninth inning was certainly a big thrill, and I'll never forget the rest of my life. But Ted had more thrills to come. He was hitting 400 going into the last day of the season, and there was talk he might sit out the doubleheader on that final day. A newspaper man came down, Jack Mulaney of the Washington Post, blue sitting in the dugout, he says, Ted's hitting 400, is he going to play it again? So I looked at Ted, I said, Ted, you going to play? Sure, I'll play. It was just one of those things. There was no doubt in my mind that I was going to play. I, heck, I didn't even think about sitting out. And that first game, I think I got three for four, and, you know, well over 400. And then I remember distinctly that he came to me the second game, before the second game, and he says, how do you feel? And, I mean, there was no doubt about it. I said, I want to play. And as, as things turned out, you know, boom, I got three more hits. So uh, it was a great day for me. A splendid day, in fact, for the splendid splinter, whose 406 average may never be reached again. In the 1941 World Series, Mickey Owen became a household name. The Brooklyn Dodgers had seemingly even the series against the Yankees at two games apiece, as Tommy Hendrick struck out. But catcher Mickey Owen let the pitch get by. Hendrick was safe at first, and the Yankees had new life. Joe DiMaggio singled, 
Charlie Keller doubled, and soon four runs came in, all with two out in the ninth. The Yankees went on to capture still another World Series. But the delight of baseball fans would soon simmer. In the grim shadow of World War II, baseball continued, despite the absence of most of its top stars, many of whom readily gave up the safety of the dugout for the foxhole. When the war hit, your priorities went immediately into the service. And I couldn't wait to get in. I didn't think I was indifferent from any other young man. I enlisted in the Air Force August 27th, 1942. When you're called up to protect what you have here, why are you going to do it? Just like anybody else. I mean, I was, I'm not going to say I was happy to do it, but you do it. I never wanted to be a soldier, but, you know, my country was in trouble and everybody went in. It was a question of Germany, you know, to conquer the world. And uh, uh, there was no choice. Everybody joined up. And so, some of the game's most popular players change uniforms. And while several found themselves in the thick of the battle, many spent a good deal of time playing baseball with pickup teams on ball fields overseas. But regardless of their military duty, once these guys started returning to the States, they had a new appreciation for their real jobs. When I came back, I felt like, wow, what a great way to make a living. You'd go out and get your hands and face dirty in uniform and sweat and then have the opportunity to take a shower and put your clothes on. You know, in the service, we went for like two and three months without a shower. And the scared kid that was there in 42 was now feeling pretty comfortable because I knew that if I didn't do well, they weren't going to shoot me, that they were going to take a, bring a relief pitcher in. Baseball was still important, but it wasn't as important as it was when you were a kid uh, before the war it became less important to me it's only a game and uh, anybody that anyone that says that uh, you're playing sports is like being in a war i got news for them they've never been in a war and as ball players returned from the battlefield fans began to flow to the parks in record numbers with a newfound appreciation for america's game and when the 1946 world series commenced Two MVPs met head-to-head, -head, Ted Williams and Stan Musial. Williams resumed a career that would result in a lifetime 344 batting average and 521 home runs. Williams' rival, Stan the Man Musial, rose to stardom during the war years and stayed on top as he hit over 316 consecutive seasons while winning seven batting crowns. But the 1946 Red Sox Cardinals series is remembered for another name. Seventh game, score tied, last of the eighth, when Enos Slaughter, playing with a broken elbow, led off with a sharp single to center. Two Cardinal batters tried to advance Slaughter but failed. The stage was set for one of baseball's most famous base running efforts as Harry Walker doubled and Slaughter, never hesitating, raced all the way from first to give the Cardinals a 4-3 advantage. This play is remembered as Slaughter's mad dash from first on a single, but it was Walker's hit scored a double which got the run home. In Boston's final inning, it all came down to pinch hitter Tom McBride. Harry the Cat Burkeen delivered the pitch that earned him his third series victory and the Cardinals their sixth world championship. This marked the end of one chapter of baseball history and the beginning of another with the arrival of Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. A star at UCLA and then in the Negro Leagues, Robinson signed a minor league contract with the Dodgers. And a year later, Dodger president Branch Rickey brought him to the majors. The move was approved by Commissioner Happy Chandler as he lifted a ban that had been maintained by his predecessor, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. For 24 years, Landis wouldn't let him play. 24 years, if you're black, you're automatically disqualified. And when they last appealed to him, he 
he was adamant. He said, everything's been said about this, it's going to be said. Of course, I made the Jackie Robinson decision. Hell, if it hadn't been for me, he wouldn't have played. In 1947, at a meeting at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, and I presided over the meeting, the owners anticipated that Ricky might want to bring Robinson from Montreal to Brooklyn, so they debated and discussed for two hours the Jackie Robinson decision, uh, situation expressly. And then they took a vote. They voted 15 to 1 not to let him play. As soon as that meeting was over, Ricky called me and I said to him simply after we discussed it, I'm going to have to meet my maker someday. And if he asked me why I didn't let this boy play, and I said it's because he's black, it might not be a satisfactory answer. In breaking baseball's color barrier, Robinson endured unending insults, even from his own teammates. They had a a petition out that they weren't going to play with him and I said he's going to play in this club and you better wake up boys because he's only the first of many to follow. The historic moment came on April 15th at Ebbets Field against the Braves Johnny Sane. In that game Robinson sparked the Dodgers to a comeback and then went on to become rookie of the year. For the next decade he proved to be an awesome talent though to many Robinson's greatest contributions came not from his numbers, but from his courage. In the 47 World Series, Jackie's Dodgers, led by manager Burt Schotten, took on the Yankees and manager Bucky Harris. And ironically, the two best moments in the series had no effect on its outcome. In Game 4, Yankees pitcher Bill Bevins led 2-1 to one and was one out away from the first no-hitter in World Series history. But with two men on, Cookie Lavagetto laced a double off the right field wall. Both runners came around to score, giving Bevins the ignominious distinction of losing not only his no-hitter, but the game as well. In Game 6, Joe DiMaggio was thwarted in his game-winning bid by Al John Frito's sensational catch. This preserved the Dodger victory and even the series at three games apiece. But despite Cookie's double and John Frito's catch, it was the Yankees who would celebrate Game 7 and another World Series success. In 1948, Roy Campanella joined the Dodgers beginning a 10-year career that would result in three MVP awards and eventual election to the Hall of Fame. Black ball players who up to now never had a choice were finally getting the chance to play in the major leagues. That same year, the Cleveland Indians signed Larry Doby, the first black man to play in the American League. All Doby did was hit 301 and lead the Indians to only the second pennant in their history. The Indians finished the season tied with the Boston Red Sox and reached the World Series by defeating the Red Sox in the American League's first pennant playoff. Owner Bill Vecht's Indians also set a Major League attendance mark of 2.6 million in their spacious municipal stadium. The Chief Indians were player manager Lou Boudreau, who hit 355, right-hander Bob Lemon, who had his first of seven 20-win seasons, and rapid Robert Feller, who'd set a single-season strikeout record two years earlier, and who would pitch three no-hitters and 12 one-hitters in his career. The Boston Braves were the Indians' opponent in the 48 series. They featured Warren Spahn, who in his third full season showed the form that would make him the National League's all-time leading left-hander with 363 wins. Spahn was complimented by right-hander Johnny Sane, who led the majors with 24 victories. Thus, the two Braves' aces gave rise to the famed refrain, Spahn and Sane and pray for rain. In Game 1, Feller and Sane pitched shutout ball until the 8th inning, when Feller and shortstop Boudreaux tried to pick off Phil Macy at second. Macy was called safe, but a nation of fans who never saw the play argued he was out. Tommy Holmes later drilled a single to score Macy as the Braves won 1-0. Despite Feller's loss, Cleveland went on to win the World Series, 
a feat seemingly forgotten by millions of Bob Feller fans who blame the fact that he never won a series game on the disputed call at second. The Indians, however, were content to celebrate their second world championship. In 1950, baseball history was made in Philadelphia. Connie Mack, after managing the athletics for 50 years, retired. And it was now the Phillies, or Wiz Kids, who won their first pennant in 35 years. Robin Roberts won 20 games. Reliever Jim Constanti added 16. And Dick Sisler's home run against Brooklyn on the final day clinched it. Delirium in Philadelphia. But the next year, there would be even more excitement in New York. 1951, and Leo DeRocher was managing the Giants. In May, he brought up rookie Willie Mays to play center field and get the team moving. Mays got off to a slow start, but as the season progressed, the Say Hey Kid got red hot. May's success merely intensified the powerful emotions between the Giants, the Dodgers, and their fans. In New York, the question asked most often, who was the best? I think uh, the Giants and Dodgers had the greatest rivalry when they were here in New York in baseball. The reason was that their clubhouse uh, was like right there, and over here was our clubhouse, and there was a door in between. And you could hear them talking, you could hear us talking. And we'd holler at each other in between the door. By August 11th, Brooklyn had an 11 and a half game lead on the Giants, and some Dodgers were getting giddy. And I remember dressing, come on, we gotta go sing by that door. I said, Charlie, I don't wanna do that. Yeah, we gotta go sing, the Giants are dead, the Giants are dead. Well, that, you know, that just rubbed me wrong, cause that's not my style. It just, you beat them, nice guys, pat them on the back, say, hey, get us next time or something. But he, he, I think that riled him up also because I thought that was a very bush maneuver to, to rub their noses in it. Well, something certainly spurred them on as the Giants started to win games with uncanny regularity and the Dodgers began to take notice. The Giants got hot. I don't know how many of them won 40 out of 45 games or out of part of the season. And they just kept coming. And the first thing you know, you start watching the scoreboard every day and see what's the score, what's the Giants doing? Well, instead of really going out and taking the care of the game that you have there. And uh, so it comes down the last day in Philadelphia, we're playing the Phillies and uh, the Giants are playing... Boston. I'll never forget it. Uh, we ended up winning the ball game. So now we're in the locker room and everybody's celebrating the pennant, you know, as if we'd, we won the pennant because you guys at that point were, uh, what, four or five runs behind? Right. Fifth, sixth inning, something like that. So. We thought we'd won the pennant. But Jackie Robinson cracked a 14th inning home run to give the Dodgers the win and set up a best of three playoff series with the Giants. I'll never forget Campanella saying on the train riding home, he said, oh my goodness, we got to face Magley. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes. And I remember getting to Grand Central Station and of course a lot of people were waiting for us. And I thought, we got to play those Dodgers. And the thing that people never talk about is that Thompson hit a home run off me in the first game and gave the Giants a, a two-run lead. Tuesday, Labine pitched in the polo grounds and beat the Giants 10-0. And then, of course, Newcomb went a strong game, you know, just got tied in the, uh, the ninth inning. I said, you know, I told him, nice going. I said, I'm going to get him for you, you know. I'll get him for you. He said, okay. Well, I have last of the night. Back of pitches. Bobby Thompson takes a strike call on the inside corner. Oops. Oh, no. Right I, down the middle. Why'd I you take, take that? that one. I don't know. <laughs> The good Lord said, don't swing at that, baby. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you hit that one, I would be mad. Back of throws. There's a long back. I see me. I believe. The Giants have the pennant. The Giants have the pennant. The Giants have the pennant. The Giants win 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 the pennant. Hang on, boy. I look like a, you can tell I'm an old cowboy. Yeah, but you, you know, can tell you had no, more hair, too, and it was <laughs> black. <laughs> it was the shot heard round the world, but it was also the Giants' best and last shot as they went on to lose to the Yankees in the World Series four games to two.
1949, the New York Yankees added an extra dimension to their already talented club. They hired Charles Dillon Casey Stingle to be their manager. And Casey, who possessed a unique combination of intelligence, humor, and charm, led the Yankees to World Series victories in 49 and 50. 1951 was a winner too, even if it was Joe DiMaggio's last season. His final game came in the World Series as he doubled to right. Later, DiMaggio was thrown out at third. His speed diminished, but his graceful style was still more than apparent. A big gap had to be filled in center, but Casey had a rookie named Mickey Mantle who was equal to the task. Immediately, Mantle was tabbed as the fastest man in the majors. But his great speed was almost incidental when compared to his raw power. Enough power to sustain the Yankee dynasty for another decade. But the Yankees didn't win on brute force alone. In the early 50s, they possessed one of baseball's best pitching staffs. Chief Allie Reynolds threw two no-hitters in 1951 and ranked second in total World Series victories. Vic Rashi, the Springfield Rifle. Junk ball pitcher, Eddie Lopat. And a young left-hander named Whitey Ford. Ford would go on to set World Series records for victories, strikeouts, and scoreless innings. He would also win 236 games, losing only 106, the top winning percentage in modern-day baseball. Casey Stingle got the most out of his players, especially scrappers like Phil Rizzuto. A personal favorite of Casey was catcher Yogi Berra, one of baseball's genuine clutch hitters. Yogi hit 358 career home runs, and only Ruth and Mantle hit more in the World Series. Another Stingle favorite was the Yankees' pugnacious second baseman, Billy Martin. In the 1953 World Series, Billy the Kid batted 500, and his last hit was a seventh game winner that gave Casey and the Yanks five straight World Series titles, the greatest team record in baseball history. And as the old professor used to say, you can look it up. In 1954, Stingle's Yankees won 103 games, but were beaten out by the Indians, who set a league record with 111 victories. The Indians succeeded on the strength of their marvelous pitching staff, led by Bob Lemon, who won 23 games that season. Early win also won 23. And Mike Garcia, the Big Bear, chipped in with 19 victories. Cleveland's arms made the Indians strong favorites when they took on New York. But Vic Wirtz and his tribesmen were in for a surprise. In the first game of the series, Wirtz drilled one 460 feet. But Willie Mays made a classic catch, one of the all-time greats. Giant fans had come to expect the impossible from Mays, but there's no way they were expecting the exploits of pinch hitter Dusty Rhodes. Dusty won the first game in the 10th inning with a pinch hit home run, hit another homer the next day, and drove in key runs in the third game as well. The Giants swept the favored Indians four straight, and once again proved that in baseball, anything is possible. But in 1955, the residents of Brooklyn were still wondering if it was possible for their Dodgers to win a World Series. They had lost seven series, the last five to the Yankees. But as rookie manager Walter Alston prepared his team for Yankee Stadium and an old nemesis, the Dodgers vowed that this would be their year to win it all. But Joe Collins scorched Don Newcomb in the opening game. The Yankee first baseman hit two home runs. And when New York took the second game as well, it looked like business as usual for Brooklyn. 
The Dodgers returned to Ebbets Field still hopeful but aware that no series team had ever come back after losing the first two games. Dodger catcher Roy Campanella got Brooklyn rolling in the third game with a first inning homer. It seemed to wake the Dodgers up as they went on to score six more runs. Brooklyn won the game 8-3 as Southpaw Johnny Padres, pitching on his 23rd birthday, scattered seven hits in his first series victory. The Yankees' lead now stood at two games to one. In game four, Dodgers center fielder Duke Snyder, the Duke of Flatbush, came through big as he blasted one of his four series homers. This one, a three-run cloud, gave Brooklyn a 7-3 lead. Later, with a man on and two out in the seventh, the Duke made the big play, choking off a Yankee rally. The Dodgers took game four, 8-5, and won the fifth game, 5-3. A three-game sweep in Ebbets Field, and Dim Bums were only a game away from their dream. But the Yankees took the sixth game at the stadium. So before Game 7, Walter Alston held a meeting, and the slugging Dodgers came out bunting. Snyder bunted Pee Wee Reese to second. The Duke appeared out at first, but knocked the ball loose from Moose Scourin's glove. The wheels were turning. Campanella's bunt advanced both runners. It was Gil Hodges' turn. A sacrifice fly scored Reese with Brooklyn's second run. But in Yankee Stadium, a two-run lead wasn't safe with Yogi Berra up and two men on. It looked like trouble, but Sandy Amaros made the catch that would enshrine his memory in Brooklyn forever. Gil McDougal, who had rounded second, had to go back, but the relay from Amaros to Reese to Hodges completed the biggest double play in Dodger history. In the ninth inning, Johnny Padres was still on the mound, leading 2-0 with two away. The series was history, Brooklyn's first and only world championship. Next year had finally come, the one year that would last forever in the heart of Brooklyn. The glorious post-game images of the triumphant Dodgers would never, ever be forgotten. The next season, 1956, the Yankees and Dodgers were matched up again. New York won in seven games, but something happened in Game 5 which transcended the entire series. In the ninth inning, Don Larson stood one out away from something never before considered, a perfect World Series game. Pinch hitter Dale Mitchell was his last obstacle. Here, Larson recalls those final historic moments. There was one thought going through my mind. He's a fastball hitter. He likes him up. Pitch him low and away. Concentrate. Concentrate. The count was coming to one and two, and I could feel the tenseness building up. No one said anything. No one on the field or on the bench talked about a no-hitter. They were too superstitious, but I knew I had one going. Before the ninth, I had said to Mantle, wouldn't it be something if I got a no-hitter? He just looked at me as if I was crazy and moved away. The guys on the team were praying the ball wouldn't be hit to them. They were afraid they'd make an error. I don't think I ever felt more alone in my life. With that called third strike, Don Larson gave baseball its first perfect game in 34 years and the only one ever in a World Series. All from a pitcher who won just 11 games in his best season. Still another instance in baseball history when the unlikely hero rises up to astound the world. In 1957, four years after the Boston Braves franchise headed west to Milwaukee, Warren Spahn, a holdover from Boston, helped Milwaukee to its first pennant by winning 21 games. 
Milwaukee also claimed two hitting greats. Hammer and Hank Aaron, who won the Major League home run crown, and slugger Eddie Matthews. But in the World Series, the biggest star was right-hander Lou Burdett, who pitched 24 consecutive scoreless innings against the perennial American League champion New York Yankees. The Braves' defense also excelled, as Wes Covington made this grab in Game 2 to help earn a 4-2 victory. Defensive plays highlighted the entire series. In center field, Hank Aaron made this catch in Game 3. Here's Gil McDougal in the fourth inning of a scoreless Game 5. And here's Wes Covington making the play that prevents a home run as the Braves went on to win the game 1-0. The series came down to the seventh game, played at Yankee Stadium. The Braves, again behind Burdett, led 5-0, with Moose scouring at bat and the bases loaded in the ninth inning. Eddie Matthews made the play. Lou Burdett won his third series game, the second by shutout, and Milwaukee won its first World Series. It had been a long time since the 1914 Miracle Braves. Milwaukee had become quite a success story, and it wasn't long before other franchises also began to look west. In 1958, the Giants said goodbye to New York and hello San Francisco. That same season, Brooklyn's heart was broken for the last time when the Dodgers opted for the golden sunshine of Los Angeles and found a home in the L.A. Coliseum. A year later, they won the World Series and broke all attendance marks. In 1960, attention turned back east to Pittsburgh, where the Pirates had won their first pennant since 1927. That year, the Bucks had been wiped out in four straight by the Yankees. Coincidentally, the Yanks were in it again in 60. But this time, the Pirates, led by right fielder Roberto Clemente, were in better shape to halt the pinstripe juggernaut. Game 7, and Pirate hopes were dim, as New York led 7-4 in the 8th. It looked even darker when Bill Verdon slapped one to short. The crowd was stunned as Tony Kubek was victimized by the granddaddy of all bad hops. The Yankees shortstop would have to leave the game. Casey Stingle appeared to sense a fast-gathering storm. The Pirates quickly scored a run, and Casey went to the mound for a pitching change and what few realized would be his last game as Yankee manager. The Pirates narrowed the gap to 7-6, but reliever Jim Coates got two outs, and Pittsburgh hopes depended on part-time catcher Hal Smith. This three-run shot put Forbes Field in a frenzy as the Pirates took a 9-7 lead with only one inning to go. Hal Smith had played for five teams in 10 years, but this year the Pirates were more than happy to have him on their side. But the Yankees retaliated with two runs to tie it in the ninth. Then in the bottom half, the Bucks' first batter was Bill Mazeroski, better known for his glove than his bat. On the mound, Yankee right-hander Ralph Terry, about to become a part of baseball folklore. There's a swing and a high fly ball going deep left. This may do it. Back to the wall goes Barry. It is over the fence. Home run. The Pirates win. Pirate fans celebrated their first world title in 35 years. It was a World Series moment that wouldn't be matched for another 33 years. The 1961 Yankees were in a pennant race, but that fact seemed far less important than the exploits of Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris, who were taking on Babe Ruth's single-season mark of 60 home runs, a record that had stood for 34 years. 
By July 1st, Mantle had 27 homers, Maris 28. And for the first time, sports writers began to take notice of the M&M boys as they went ahead of Ruth's home run pace. But in the closing weeks of the season, Mantle had to drop out when he was sidelined with a leg injury. Maris was now on his own, and as he closed in on the babe, he came up against detractors who insisted that if he caught Ruth, he must do so in 154 games, as Ruth did. The pressure became almost unbearable. The thing that just really made it tough is that right up to game time, they felt that almost that I should be there for interviews. So I wasn't getting the proper uh, warming up and everything that I, or routine that I, yeah. I, I needed to go through to keep myself loose and then of course after the ball game it made it difficult because uh, I sat there until the last writer filtered in and went out there was no organized period of a half hour an hour an hour and a half hell some days I was there three four hours after a ball game just sitting there uh, with interviews and it did get grueling that that really hurt Despite the pressure, Maris continued his assault and hit number 59 in Baltimore in the Yankees' 155th game. Six days later, Yankee Stadium with Baltimore the foe once again. Two to nothing, Baltimore, third inning. Two outs, nobody on. There it is. There it is. If it stays fair, and it is number 60. A standing ovation for Roger Maris, who got number 60. Yankee fans everywhere were asking the same question. Could Maris break Babe Ruth's record on the final day of the season? We got a handful of people sitting out in left field, but in right field, man, it is mobbed out there. And they're standing up. Here's the windup. Fastball hits deep to right. It's I was fortunate enough to hit the 61. I was just doing my job. It was all in line of duties. I really didn't feel it was anything special that I should go jump out in the field and tip my hat and throw my hands up. And when I came in, of course, the people kept clapping and clapping. The guys trying to push me out of the dugout. And I was embarrassed to go out there. You know, here I am, all these people, you know. And you, 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 I, it was really, I was embarrassed to go out there. In 1962, the Dodgers' Maury Wills broke Ty Cobb's stolen base record set in 1915. Will stole 104, eight more than Cobb. The switch hitting Dodger shortstop typified the Los Angeles teams of the early 60s, speedy, scrappy, and smart. It hadn't taken long for manager Walter Alston to develop a new generation of quality ball players. Don Drysdale was one of two pitchers who led the Dodgers to championships in 63 and 65. And in 68, the Big D surpassed the big train, Walter Johnson, by pitching 58 and two-thirds consecutive innings of scoreless baseball. But the pitcher who got most of the attention was Sandy Koufax. The irony is that Koufax was born and raised in Brooklyn and signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1955, but was ineffective during his time there. But from 1962 through 66 in L.A., Koufax led the league in ERA five times, won 25 or more three times, broke Bob Feller's season strikeout record, hurled four no-hitters, including a perfect game, and struck out more batters in a World Series game than any man ever before, all in five seasons. In 1966, he also led the Dodgers to the World Series, which they lost. Then, bothered by severe pain in his throwing arm, Koufax retired at the age of 30. In 1967, the Boston Red Sox became the story, led by the amazing Carl Yastrzemski. Thanks to Ted Williams, Yaz learned to hit with more power and became the last man in baseball to win the Triple Crown. But the Sox were also in a pennant race, and that's what occupied Carl's mind. I would have never won the Triple Crown in 67 if we weren't involved in a pennant race because you weren't thinking about 
uh, winning a triple crown. You are going to the plate, taking one at bat at a time and hitting what the situation called for to help win a ball game. And when we had won the pennant in 67, that was on my mind. I never <laughs> dawned on me until the next day I picked up the paper and, and the paper says, yes, yeah, wins triple crown. Uh, you just didn't think about it. Uh, when you're involved in the pennant race, uh, that's the ultimate in sports. But despite Yastrzemski's heroics, Bob Gibson and the St. Louis Cardinals won the 1967 World Series in seven exciting games. 1968 could be called the year of the pitcher. Juan Marichal led the National League with 26 victories, one of six 20-win seasons he would have. Still, he was far outdone by Denny McLean of the Detroit Tigers, who won an incredible 31 games, a pitching accomplishment that caught everyone's fancy. And the magic number 30 came while Denny was watching from the dugout. Outfield is shallow, the pitch. Fast ball, makes it! Tigers are going to win this one! And there's the winning one, and McLean wins his 30th ball game of the year as Willie Harton comes up with a big base hit from the bottom of the ninth. The Tigers score two, and look at this celebration on the field. The defending champion St. Louis Cardinals faced the Detroit Tigers and Denny McLean in the World Series. Cardinals pitcher Bob Gibson had completed another sensational season with a 1.12 earned run average and 13 shutouts. In the first game of the series, he was at the top of his form as he broke Sandy Koufax's record of most strikeouts in a single series game. Two strikes and a ball. The pitch to K-Line. Got him! Listen to the crowd. He has just tied a World Series record. Here's Norm Cash now. Yeah! Once again, a standing ovation. A new World Series record. Here's Willie Horton now. And he could end it all now with the most dramatic of flourishes. out 17 setting a new world series record it's fantastic the fans just stood and cheered you that must be your most thrilling moment in sports you've had many well i, I guess so i didn't know what they were cheering about and uh tim came out in front of the plate and i just turned around and looked at the scoreboard i uh, i had no idea nor did tiger fans have a real idea who lou brock was but they soon found out in the series, Brock had little trouble tying his own record of seven stolen bases set the previous year. He also tied the World Series record for base hits with 13. The Cardinals raced to a three-game to one series advantage and appeared ready to clinch it in the fifth game, taking an early lead. But the fifth inning featured a key play involving Lou Brock and left fielder Willie Horton. Baseball's greatest base runner tried to score standing up and was called out. Tiger fans loved it, but the Cardinals couldn't believe it. Suddenly, everything went wrong. The Tigers rallied. Al Kaline, distinguished right fielder and future Hall of Famer, had waited 15 years to play in a World Series, and in the seventh inning, he singled in the tying and winning runs. The Tigers won game six behind Denny McLean, but then faced the invincible Gibson in game seven. It was still scoreless in the seventh inning when Jim Northrup lined a ball to center that gave smooth fielding Kurt Flood trouble. The moment was fatal for Gibson and the Cardinals as two runners scored on Northrup's triple. 
And in the year in which Gibson and McLean had dominated the headlines, Tiger left-hander Mickey Lolich wrapped up his third series victory and Detroit's first world championship in 23 years. But even in this, the year of the pitcher, some of baseball's most distinguished hitters approached milestones. Leading the pack was Mr. Henry Aaron, who in 1968 hit the 500th home run of his illustrious career. But so too was 1968 memorable for these other sluggers. Jarvis fires away. That's a fly ball, deep the left, track, track, that's it, that's it, hey, hey, he did it, Ernie Bank, got number 500. Here's the pitch to Willie. Swung on, hit deep to left. That one is way back, way back, way back. Pull up to find number 600 for Willie Mays. And the Giants come to home place to greet him. Number 600 for Mays. He hit it over the 370 foot mark. Fly ball, well hit, deep left field. It is going to be the 500th home run of a brilliant major league career. Frank Robinson has done it. Play R into his windup delivers. A curveball going on is a high fly ball hit into deep left field. It's back deep. It's going, going. Number 500 for Harm Killebrew. Boy, what an ovation. Here's the payoff pitch. This is it. There it goes. It's out of here. A convergence of memorable moments for some of baseball's very best as the game's first century drew to a close.